It's the People versus O.J. Simpson, and the week begins with Mark Furman back in the spotlight. The defense has him in their crosshairs with allegations of taped evidence of his use of racial slurs. I'm Roger Cossack, and this is O.J. 25. Back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, the jury is not present. The record should reflect that this morning the court held two in-chambers meetings with counsel, specifically with regard to an issue that has been raised by the so-called Furman tapes. McKinney, I met um, at a coffee shop, and I saw her writing, and she said, what are you doing? We just kind of entered this conversation about, you should write something about the harsh reality of, of the street and transformation of LAPD. This is a blockbuster. This is a bombshell. This is perhaps the biggest thing that's happened in any case in this country in this decade and they know it, they've got to face up to it. They have allegations, they have empty theories, they have conflicted theories, contradictions within their own theories. It's nonsense, smoke and mirrors. Should have thought about this when they put Mark Furman on the stand, and now it's too late. The truth we are searching for here, right now, in this case, is who killed these people. We know it wasn't Detective Furman. After weeks of legal wrangling, O.J. Simpson's defense team successfully appeals the North Carolina court ruling that denied them access to the tapes. The issue of their materiality becomes crystal clear once the defense and prosecution get possession of them. Furman rises or falls based upon his own voice, Your Honor. He's the one talking from April of 1985 to July 28, 1994. He's the one using these derogatory names. I am not saying that Mark Furman should be painted as a god or a hero, but he's certainly no critical witness, as counsel keeps insisting. He's the one who hates women and Mexicans and black people. He's the one who hates all of the commanders. And this case is about real people. It was explosive, and all of it took place outside the presence of the jury. The defense, of course, wanting these tapes to be introduced, wanting the jury to hear everything that Mark Furman had said, the prosecution wanting to keep them out. The only thing that both sides could agree on during the arguments was that the tapes were horrible. We have checked these tapes out, and there are at least 30 times when the so-called N-word is used to refer to either suspects, regular citizens, city council people, in disparaging terms. There are at least 17 instances in these tapes in which Furman, Detective Furman, admits or approves of planting, manufacturing evidence, lying, or covering up police misconduct. At least 17 instances. They want to manipulate this jury so they will look at only the villainous accusations made against Detective Furman. We have a big bad boy for you here who said terrible things and possibly done terrible things. That's what's important here. It would be if he could have done anything to impact the evidence in this case, but he could not. In these tapes, Mark Furman indicates, I am the key witness in the trial of the century. If I go down, the prosecution's case go down. It goes down and he says, bye bye. And that's what they're faced with, bye bye. What we vouch for in terms of Detective Furman, in terms of everyone in this case, is that no one planted any evidence at any time. For more than a year, court TV producers have sat in the courtroom taking thousands of pages of notes about everything that happens within those four walls. But they have heard nothing like the arguments over the Furman tapes. These are the things that mistrials are made of. They are the issues of race, police misconduct, and of a long time Los Angeles police code of silence that often reeks of conspiracy. They see their case floating out the window because this is a critical witness in their case. And Bailey did a good job of tying it together about whether he had lied, 
This man has committed perjury. Do you use the word in describing people? No, sir. Have you used that word in the past 10 years? Not that I recall, no. He talks about destroying people's driver's licenses and then arresting them. He talks about choking out people because they're black. When he talks about how you stop a black man, and he uses the derogatory term, in, in a Porsche, and he gives tips for stopping individuals. When he talks about how you lie to implicate people, you just arrest them because they're black, and he doesn't use the word black. Detective Mark Furman will play an integral part in this case for a number of reasons. Now, it's very interesting that the prosecution never once mentioned his name yesterday. It's like they just want to hide him. But they can't hide him. He's very much a part of this case. Mark Furman's name has been mentioned 1,813 times in the transcripts in this case. You don't think he's key to this case? You gotta understand, Judge, how important this witness is, because remember, they talk about not planning stuff? Preposterous. This man goes off by himself for 15 minutes or more, and then he supposedly finds his glove. Judge, this is after he's been taken off the case. It's not his case anymore. If there was any opportunity for anyone to plant that evidence, to plant that glove, it would be a different story, a totally different story, but there wasn't. He was their witness, and this is about credibility, and you can't wipe out credibility, because that's the key to this case for everybody, is whom are you gonna believe? There has been no false statement made about where that evidence was found, the analysis of the evidence, or its results. And the defense wants to squirm away from that fact by playing the race card. Somebody need race card? This is about credibility card. This is about perjury. Counsel for both the prosecution and the defense have advised the court that uh, their review of these tapes indicate that uh, Mr. Furman uh, apparently has made comments that are disparaging of this court's spouse, uh, Captain Margaret York of the Los Angeles Police Department. I knew Peggy York. She was a homicide detective, too, and she was a very good one. She was very good at what she did. She came up the ranks from policewoman, and then she took the sergeant's test when they allowed policewomen to actually become field officers. She came to West LA, and uh, I was working a plainclothes unit, and it was at the height of affirmative action. A lot of us were very vocal about it because, you know, the redu reducing of, of, of uh, standards. You're gonna take on a woman who just happens to be the wife of the judge and say what he said about Margaret York, which was disgusting. So to make this even more complicated, not only is Mark Furman using racial epithets in these tapes, he's also disparaging his boss, the captain who is at the time the highest ranking female member of the LAPD, and he is saying terrible things about her on these tapes. That woman is also Judge Ito's wife. It's further been indicated to the court that there is a possibility that the prosecution will call uh, Captain York to testify as a witness in this matter uh, with regard to the credibility of Mr. Furman. Now, you have the prosecution rightfully concerned about this conflict of interest in Judge Ito hearing these horrible things that the state's witness is saying about his wife, raising the question, can the judge be fair? And at this juncture, the judge has already heard eight months of testimony. This is a mess. So at this point, what is necessary to determine is whether or not Captain York will be a material witness in this case if her testimony would be relevant or material to any of the issues before the court. If that is true, then this court would be required to uh, recuse itself uh, from further participation in this case. The only reason you know about your wife being in these tapes, do you know why? Because yesterday, Ms. Clark went up there and told you about that. It would appear, based on what I've seen in this tran these transcripts, and I've read them all, that it could very well be that Captain York 
will be a rebuttal witness depending on what is deemed admissible. I don't think that's relevant because we had made a decision among the defense that it wasn't relevant. We are going to offer it. So why would we even be going into that? It has no relevance. Mr. Cochran cannot presume to think for the prosecution. He can't get into our minds or our offices or our briefcases and tell us who we can call on rebuttal and who would be appropriate. What I'm asking you to do is to receive a redacted version of the tapes. The issue you have to make is whether or not these, uh, what he says, is material. When he calls somebody the N-word judge, and it's in the last 10 years, and it's his voice, and he's speaking about how he feels about black people. One of the incidents that has racial undertones to it directly involves Captain York. It'll make the rebuttal extremely germane, and it goes right to the heart of the issue. And that very incident kind of describes the entire people's argument as to why these tapes should be deemed inadmissible, as to why they're not material, as to why this is a red herring. And we will be forced to put that on in response to the defense use of these tapes. Is Marsha Clark going to have the gall, after we play these tapes for this jury, to stand up before this jury and say, well, he didn't use the N-word. He didn't talk about throwing people downstairs and breaking their necks. He didn't do all that stuff. And, and Margaret York can tell us. That's preposterous. That is preposterous. It's not going to happen. You know it's not going to happen. The truth of the matter is that I think that what the defense wants to do here is hold this issue over the court's head, hope that the court will be inflamed enough by the mere knowledge of the fact of the allegations to either rule that the tapes come in more than it ordinarily would or bend over backward in favor of the defense to show how fair it can be or bend over backwards to take revenge against Mark Furman. If they feel it's necessary to vilify Mark Furman, surely the biggest red herring that ever was, the people offer to stipulate that he used the word in 85, 86, and 87. And I think that fairly gives them the opportunity to impeach him on a matter that is collateral at best, and yet would allow us to proceed with his trial without the need for total recusal. I take it by Mr. Cochran's rhetoric that a reasonable alternative such as the one I've suggested would never be acceptable to him. But I make it nonetheless. All right, counsel, I think I've heard enough argument. May, may I just respond to that? No, just briefly. no, Mr. Cochran, I've, no, I've heard enough. I've heard enough. Thank you. I am very reluctant to uh, send this matter out to another court for two reasons. One, um, it is an incredibly onerous burden to ask another court uh, to make this determination, both from the point of view of the voluminous record that that court would have to review uh, in order to be in a position to make an intelligent ruling uh, but it is also perhaps one of the top three most difficult decisions to make in this particular case. Uh, I love my wife dearly. And um, <clears throat> I am wounded. by criticism of her. <clears throat> As any spouse would be. And I think it is reasonable to assume uh, that that could have some impact. Judge Ito decides to recuse himself from deciding the issue of the admissibility of the Furman tapes over concerns that any decision he makes could be questioned because of Furman's comments about his wife. We've had extensive discussions upstairs, consulted with appellate uh, attorneys, and <clears throat> reviewed the case law as well. 
it would appear based on consultation with everyone that the only road to take is to uh, not to waive any matters in this court and to proceed with a complete recusal from this point forward. I would like the opportunity to brief sure this further. If there is some attempt by the people at recusal, then different things kick in. Uh, they have to agree that the Judicial Council makes assignments and those sort of things. And so we need to hear from them where they are so they can tell you to your face what they want to do. This has been the subject of continual and ongoing discussion in the office, Your Honor. And I'm asking leave of the court for this evening to brief it out and to make sure of our position and to present it to the court tomorrow in a cogent fashion and to solidify uh, the position of the people in this matter. Today they came for Judge Ito. When he sent that case out this morning, or for this afternoon, he thought he was sending it out for the limited purpose of having the issue of materiality of those tapes and his wife's, whether his wife's name would be used in the, in the course of this trial. When they get up there, they tell the other judges, oh no, we want Judge Ito gone forever. Judge Ito has done one thing, and that is taking this case to a point where we are close to finishing and hopefully get a verdict. To try to remove him at this point in time is something we will do everything within our power to fight against. Newspaper headlines reflect the dramatic turn of events that leave the future of O.J. Simpson's trial in jeopardy. But it is the black-owned L.A. Sentinel that most emphatically sums up what is happening in the courtroom. My position was, if given the legal team that O.J. had, that he put together, that he had the money to buy, if he can't find justice, no black man, woman, or child in America could find justice. By the time that Mark Furman emerged as a pivotal um, witness in the case, it was pretty obvious in mainstream coverage that race was becoming um, a key um, uh, prism through which the case might be decided. We're not playing any race card or whatever here. We're playing a perjury card. When Marsha Clark said, I'll stipulate, we'll stipulate, he used the N-word. Well, it's more than that. He used the N-word more than 30 times. It's the 17 times in those tapes that he talked about framing people or setting up people. All right, back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, Mr. Simpson is again present before the court with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Blazer, Mr. Allman, Mr. Newfeld, people represented by Ms. Clark and Mr. Darden. All right, Ms. Clark, you asked leave of the court yesterday uh, afternoon uh, to do some additional research and to contemplate your position uh, in this matter. What news do you have to bring to the court? Our position has always been, Your Honor, that we wanted a fair trial that would focus on the issues. We've objected from the start to the introduction of race because we knew it would skew the trial away from the evidence. And all our concerns have now been proven to be true. And now that all the defense efforts to present evidence of another perpetrator and police conspiracy have fallen flat and shown to be devoid of facts or evidence, they've turned to the N-word. Upon weighing the apparent conflict and the defense desire to make these tapes the cornerstone of their case against the ability of this court to maintain its impartiality in the face of great temptation to do otherwise, we have determined that our faith in this court's wisdom and integrity has not been and will not be misplaced. Although our review of the case law indicated that we are entitled under the law to seek the course of full recusal, we have decided that it would not be the appropriate course in this case. After the prosecution announced a complete change of heart with regard to Ito's recusal, Ito rules he will not disqualify himself from the trial and will refer only the matter of the relevance of his wife's testimony to Judge John Reed. My emotions are up to here. Over and above the loss of my brother, I have all this other crap to deal with. These last few days have pushed me to the edge. I have never been more offended, okay, by the actions on behalf of the defense. Ron 
and Nicole were butchered by their client. Do any of you believe otherwise? You have seen the evidence in this trial. It is overwhelming. This is not now the Furman trial. This is a trial about the man that murdered my son. How dare they take the position that all they want to do is prove perjury. They are liars. The further into the trial we went, the more absurd things became, the more you heard coming from the defense side. Shapiro back in, I don't know what month it was, said that he would never play the race card in this case. Call it whatever you want, race card, perjury card, I don't care what you call it. The issue was still the same. I think they pushed the line of ethics and morals um, far beyond what their role was as a defense attorney. Are we all fools? Do they take us all for morons? We all know what they want is to inflame the, the emotions of the jury and to inflame anyone's minds, the public's minds, with issues that don't relate to this trial. Mr. Simpson, uh, if the court will allow me, wants this court to be aware of the fact that certainly he, along with all of us in this courtroom, his heart goes out to the families and the victims of this case. And he is also a victim in this case. I reject totally supposed feelings of people that on an, on an everyday basis would do anything under the sun, including cheating, lying, reporting mistruths, all for the purpose of making certain that their client goes free. They've had ample opportunity since June 12th to say one anything to us, which they have not done. So to stand in open court and pledge their sympathy to the judge is ridiculous and it's offensive to me and it's offensive to our family and insulting. These are not people who are interested in the truth. These are people who are only interested in seeing their client go free and they will do it at all costs. We try to conduct ourselves in a way throughout uh, regarding the families of these victims. But we have a man who from the very beginning has maintained his innocence. And he is troubled by what the so-called authorities have done to hide and cover up for the Detective Furman. I think that what they did to people's reputations and careers and um, to incite a, a deeper racial divide in this country um, was just unforgivable. Um, and I, I understand that that, that worked. <laughs> they did their job, right? So I get that. Um, I don't have to like it and I don't have to respect it. As OJ25 continues, the two sides get personal. Defense attorney Robert Shapiro and prosecutor Christopher Darden go after each other in open court. At issue, fallout from the attempt by the prosecution to get Judge Lance Ito removed from the case. Mr. Shapiro. Yes, Your Honor. I'd like uh, to respectfully request permission for myself, Mr. Cochran, and Dean Ullman to address the court to put on the record what took place in chambers this morning, not as advocates, but as witnesses, so that we can have an accurate record of what took place, because we think this is crucial to the trial. Now, as to this in chambers issue, counsel, I'll entertain your comments for five minutes. I realize you want to make your record. I'm going to restrict this, however, to one speaker per side. Your Honor heard this morning from Ms. Clark about ethical responsibilities and why they had to pursue this remedy and approach you like a doctor would a patient who had a malignancy. 
and say that we may have to go for a complete recusal. That was behind your back. That was done in front of Judge Reed after they knew you had sent it out for a limited purpose. But the true reason of why they sought your recusal came out in an honest and frank discussion by Mr. Darden today in Chambers. He said, Judge, I haven't vented in a long time, and I'd like to vent. We think you've been unfair with us. We think you've been unfair to the prosecution. It started with Mr. Kelberg. You cut Mr. Kelberg off. You allowed Mr. Cochran six days of cross-examination, and you would not allow Mr. Kelberg cross-examination. We have to quit at this point. This is the last area, as I said, hopefully five minutes. Your Honor, I can't control the length of the Well, answer. you just heard the reaction from the jury. We're going to quit now. Mr. Darden said, you embarrassed Mr. Kelberg. You ridiculed him in front of the jury, and we don't like that. You also continue to do that with Ms. Clark. Ask him a contemporaneous question. What's his opinion about whether or not that would have been a useful scientific technique at that time on those samples? I was just about to get to that. Let's try the Simpson case sometime today. You cut her off. You vilified her in front of the jury. We don't like that. And that was the reason that they had threatened this recusal against you. And Mr. Cochran became so indignant, as did I and as did Dean Ullman, that we literally stormed out of your chambers. And for that, we apologize. But we were so taken back by what amounted to prosecutorial extortion of the judiciary that we felt that it had to be addressed and had to be corrected immediately. The implicit message was they want to play with their ball, on their field, with their referee. And as soon as you disagree with their decision, you're out. Darden parried Shapiro's accusations with indictments of his own against the defense. He charged the defense with a year-long extortion by promising at the start of the case not to introduce race into the trial and reneging on the promise over the past few days. Darden accused the defense of manipulating the media and presenting a case replete with lies. When I went into chambers this morning, I went into chambers to vent, to complain to you that I did not appreciate the manner in which Mr. Kelberg and Ms. Clark was treated before this jury by the court. I came into chambers to try and hammer out some of the, the issues that are confronting us so that we can continue with this trial, convict this defendant, and so I can get on with my life. When they talk about unethical conduct, I think it's unethical to present a defense that is based completely on mistruths, lies, and deception. And that is what they've done throughout this case. I think it is unethical for counsel to hold press conferences in this courtroom and downstairs on the first floor and tease the public and tease the media by throwing them bits and pieces of the contents of these tapes, arousing the public, arousing a certain element, a certain parts of the, of the public, inflaming their passions in an attempt to exert political pressure over you to admit the Furman tapes tapes that are largely, if not completely, irrelevant to the issues at hand. The issue here is Kim Goldman, Patty Goldman, Fred Goldman, and the Brown family. The issue here is whether this defendant killed Nicole Brown or Ron Goldman or not. The issue here isn't my ethics. The issue here isn't racism. The issue here isn't Detective Furman. And it isn't their egos and how much money they can make or how many talk shows they can appear on. This case is a circus, and they've made it a circus. And I know that you've tried to do everything you could to prevent that. And so have we. Now, Mr. Shapiro and Mr. Cochran want to refer me to the state bar, fine. Because when this case is over, I'm going to be referring to Fitz attorneys to the United States Attorney's Office. Let's have the jury. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you again for your uh, great endurance and patience with us. Always in the back of my mind, I'm aware that you're either back there or upstairs or at the hotel. And I'm always aware that we're taking your time and that court time not spent dealing with you is, in your minds, wasted time. I started sensing that they, being Judge Ito, the prosecution team, the defense team, were starting becoming cognizant of the weariness of the jury and that we can't lose anyone else. Next witness. Defense calls Michelle Castle, please. K-E-S-T-L-E-R. Mr. Newfield. Thank you. Ms. Castle, what is your current title? I'm employed by the city of Los Angeles, Los Angeles Police Department as uh, chief forensic chemist. And uh, are you also the uh, director of the Scientific Investigation Division Laboratory? I'm the director of the Criminalistics Laboratory, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and what was your title as of June 12, 1994? I was the assistant laboratory director, or one of the assistant laboratory directors. And during the first couple of weeks after June 12, 1994, didn't you participate in several meetings concerning this case? I wouldn't say several, maybe two or three, maybe right. four meetings. Not a lot. I don't recall a lot of meetings. Do you remember uh, the subject matter at the very first meeting you participated in connection with this case? No. No. I'm sorry, no? No. Isn't it true that as early as 8.30 in the morning on June 13th, you would telephone, they called you at your home to tell you about this case? Objection on the leading. Sustain. The defense's um, opening statements, you know, um, um, hinted at um, sort of a theory of rush to judgment, a possible um, um, uh, tampering with evidence to, um, in their view at least, ensure a conviction of an obviously guilty man. They worked very hard on this case because in their rush to judgment, they fixed on this one individual and that's what they focused on. And we think the evidence will show that that's exactly what they did. About how many cases did your, did your laboratory uh, handle last year? Now we're we talking about crime scenes? Cases in which your laboratory became involved initially because it was a crime scene that had to be processed, and then items were brought back to the laboratory and analyzed. Okay, for criminal, criminalists only, right? Yes. Okay, about, probably about 400. Okay, and of those 400, how many cases did you personally sit down for perhaps a half a dozen hours straight, personally uh, analyzing or examining items of evidence of those 400 cases? I didn't personally examine anything this first week either. Um, I'm just asking you, of those 400 cases, putting this case aside, how many of those cases did you personally examine items of evidence for several hours at a time? Well, none, including this one. I feel that there was a certain arrogance on the forensic people's uh, parts in regard to not following procedure. It just seems to me like these these people have this uh, uh, preconceived notion in their own minds. You spend approximately seven hours. Would that be a fair estimate on the evening of on the afternoon and evening of June 29th, 1994, uh, examining items of evidence in this case with Mr. Yamuchi, and Mr. Matheson? We did an inventory of the evidence, if, if, we, if I could use that term, and it took Fine. several hours. Several hours. I think, uh, would it be fair to say that you started about 2 or 2.30 in the afternoon? I believe so. And you went till about 9, 9.30 in the evening? Probably. Okay. Now, my question is, on how many others of the 400 cases that your laboratory processed in the last 12 months did you spend seven hours back in the laboratory personally um, inventorying the evidence in the case? I didn't. In a this would be the only case? Yes. As the director of the Criminalistics Laboratory of the Los Angeles Police Department, you were Dennis Fung's boss, is that correct? Mm, I was his ultimate superior, not immediate supervisor by any means. Did you review the property reports that were prepared by Dennis Fung in connection with this case? I can't remember if I reviewed all of his property reports or some of them. 
I, we've looked at them off and on for item numbers, and I don't remember if I've seen all of them. Dennis Fung is one of those names we heard time and time again in this trial. And here are his names coming up one more time. Surprisingly for what? The collection of evidence and the defense trying to destroy the way in which it was collected and mistakes that were made along the way. And now they're doing it through his supervisor. She's realizing on the stand about more mistakes that he made. 187 of the official property reports uh, filled out for items 1 through 14 in this case, which would be items taken at, at Rockingham. Could you take a look at that? Yes. And I believe you said a moment ago that it's required that these reports be filled out accurately and completely. Is that right? Yes. Was any remedial action taken with Dennis Fung for his using the incorrect dates uh, repeatedly in this report? Incorrect dates? Well, sustain. Let me ask you this. Do you see where it says what date these property items were taken into custody? Oh, I hadn't even noticed that before. I thought the defense very adroitly um, went after the collection of evidence, and uh, there, there were mistakes that were made. You see where it says that they were taken into custody on June 12, 1994? Yes. That's not correct, is it? I don't think so. It's June 13th, right? Okay. And in fact, on page three, take a look at page three, would you? There, Dennis Fung wrote that all these items were collected on June 14th, didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. Did it change, ultimately, what evidence was found? Uh, I don't think so. But in terms of specific techniques, the things could have been done better. Presenting the next defense witness. I will, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Cochran. A-G-U-I-L-A-R. Mr. Cochran. Good morning, Mr. Aguilar. Good morning. Uh, sir, what is your uh, occupation? Because I'm a forensic print specialist employed by the Los Angeles Police Department, assigned to the Scientific Investigations Division with the latent print section. with the Simpson case, uh, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what role you played in that regard, sir? Yes, in this case, I did all of the comparison work. I compared all of the fingerprints that were found at the crime scene to known fingerprints or to inked fingerprint impressions. With regard to any of the prints lifted from the Bundy crime scene, those prints were compared with Mr. Simpson's prints, and he did not make any of those prints. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And that determination was made on June 13th of 1994, is that correct? Yes. There were identifiable fingerprints, which not match and don't match Mr. O.J. Simpson, any of the police officers there. Did you go out and try to take and get the prints of everybody who you knew had been at the scene on or about uh, the early morning hours of June 13th of 1994? Yes, we tried to get everybody's fingerprints. And altogether, there were some 58 uh, names that you, you ran or checked? Yes. Isn't it true that there were 17 lifts lifted from Bundy? And of those 17 lifts, there are nine lifts that were identifiable, but you can't tell us who made those prints. Isn't that correct? Yes. Now, we don't always leave fingerprints on every surface we touch, do we? Very rarely. And you can't always lift a fingerprint from, from uh, each and every kind of surface, can you? No. Assuming that you have a fingerprint on a pair of leather gloves, and the gloves are also bloody, can you do both the serological analysis and uh, lift the fingerprint? If you have a latent print that's there, yeah. you'd have to uh, take the blood before you try to process it for fingerprints because the chemicals that we would use to process it for any latent prints would destroy any evidential value of the blood. 
And any chemical used to, to remove the blood could also uh, uh, destroy the, uh, the underlying latent fingerprint. Is that correct? Or will is that correct? Yes, even if you uh, don't use chemicals, you're just wiping it off, will destroy print. What are the chances of, of, of uh, lifting a late print off of a uh, pair of leather gloves? Sustain. Okay. Well, have you ever lifted a fingerprint off a pair of leather gloves? Never do, been able to develop an identifiable print. Herman made a claim about a, a bloody fingerprint on one of the rear gates. And is that the rear gate where you just described seeing the blood droppings on the lower rung and the middle, and then the smudge on the latch? Yes. And where, what else were you able to see on that gate, sir? Uh, not at that time, but later I saw a uh, partial possible fingerprint that was uh, on that uh, knob area. I saw Tom Lang with the murder book open. And so I walk by and go, hey, Tom, um, uh, whatever happened with the results from that fingerprint on the back gate? And he, he did this exact. Said nothing. So I go into Marsha Clark's office and I said, well, what happened to the fingerprint? And Marsha Clark just goes, they, uh, they never collected it. I said, it was right in my notes. She goes, I never read them for two months. We had four print techs there who got 17 latent lifts, did the rear gate, did the whole house, was there for many, many hours, four of them printing. Nobody else saw it. He didn't point it out during the walkthrough. It was nonsense. It was on a piece of brass, and it was in red blood. And it was probably 15 points plus, if not more. And you said here, possible blood smudge and visible fingerprint. Can you describe what it was you saw that caused you to write that? Yes, on the uh, inside where I described the, the deadbolt style lock on the inside or the east side of the, the gate on the turn knob, it's brass, brass plated. It looked to be blood smudge on that leading to what I saw might be a possible fingerprint or a partial fingerprint. Okay. And so you made a note of that? Yes. She was trying to get me to testify that it was only a possible print so it didn't have to really have any impact negatively on the investigation and also a place where the defense couldn't find another hole where the investigation was sloppy. The defense wraps up the week trying to prove O.J. Simpson wasn't at the Bundy crime scene on the night of the murders. Coming up, renowned forensic scientist Dr. Henry Lee joins the Dream Team and testifies that something is wrong with the way the Bundy crime scene was handled. This two-dimensional pattern cannot be come from a global nightmare. That's next on OJ25. I'm Roger Cossack.